consider. Okay, so we are now recording, so we can um, get this recording to other folks that have not yet um, participated and will be joining us at a future date, uh, or they're going to view this video on a future date. So admitting two more folks, we got 32. Okay, so let's do a quick round of introduction, just really quick, um, so we can get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if everyone is on Pacific Standard Time, it is about 1 p.m. And um, my name is James Castillo. I'm the program director for this uh, sustainability program. I'm a um, climate reality uh, leader, trained leader, as well as a member of the CODES Coalition, Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability spearheaded by the United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, my day job is in IT, and I'm also a filmmaker. And, um, and so, you know, the topic of sustainability touches everyone. And so we're here to make sense out of it and make people understand it. It is something that, um, that everyone should be um, thinking about as we transition the new paradigm because the old paradigm is not working and the LA is under a blizzard warning right now. And so things are changing a lot and, and you know we need to make sense out of it, to be prepared, to be able to adapt and also to transform the world as how we want to see it. And uh, today Tania has a, a wonderful presentation that um, I hope everyone can also appreciate. So. Let's go uh, around real quick. Who is here at the Echo Park Library to introduce themselves, and um, and then we'll we'll have Tania introduce herself and uh, get started with her presentation. I'll start. Um, I'm Jocelyn Diago Rosenthal, and I'm on the board of the Friends of the Echo Park Library. I also serve on the commission, I'm an appointed commissioner of the City um, Building and Safety Commission. And my, uh, my, uh, my intent, of course, is to advocate for sustainability in my role as commissioner. Okay. I'm Francie Schwartz. I'm the public service librarian here at the Echo Park Ranch. Thank you. And uh, I'm Jaime Giaga. Can you see me over there? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the I'm a board member and officer treasurer, and I chair the Carlos Lugos and Book Club. Welcome everybody to our sustainability and environmental project. I'm Belinda Rocaello, and I'm member and supporting the Friends Echo Park Library and. Uh, Helping the book scene. Hi, I'm David Rockwell, the president of the Friends of Echo Park Library. I want to welcome everybody to this program and uh, I want to thank Jaime and Jocelyn and Vicki and, of course, James and everybody else on this wonderful uh, Zoom call that we're having uh, for participating today. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy our program today. Hi, this is Greg Diaga. Um, I'm just here as somebody supporting urban sustainable gardening. Uh, I study horticulture uh, with a focus on propagation of native plants and uh, native plant uses by uh, different communities. Um, but that's about it. I have, I have a certificate or in permaculture uh, and just am interested in the use of uh, sustainable practices. Oh, okay, can keep that mic. Uh, thank you, everyone. And later on, uh, as time permits, we will have other folks join us and, um, and introduce yourself. So now I will make Tanya our host, and she can introduce herself and start her presentation. Co-host. Co-host. Okay, make, uh, make co-host. So she can share her presentation, and then um, just 
have um should we keep it like that is that fine you have to make her a small spotlight as a main spotlight okay um so i'll remove myself from the spotlight and the other cameras okay all right Tania, take it away Great, thank you so much everyone for having me, for hosting this presentation, um, this program, it's amazing. And I agree, this topic biodiversity is something that I think is starting to get talked about more, but um, I do think we can talk a lot more about it and I'll talk about why. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Let me know if you can't see. Um, slideshow yes, again perfect awesome well yes hi so my name is tanya again tanya roa and i am the co-founder and co-host of a social justice podcast um i also love the environment i love nature and so a lot of what i do is combining those social justice and and nature in my work so i first want to talk about before we even get into why preserve biodiversity, what is biodiversity? I feel like we need to start with the basics um, just to make sure we're on the same page. And so biodiversity stands for biological diversity and it really is life on earth. It's us, it's plants, animals, fungi, anything that's alive on this planet. And it's the basis of ecosystems. It makes up uh, oceans, savanna, woodlands, forests, deserts, all these different places that we call home, that other species call home, and that make up the planet that we know, our only home. And biodiversity and ecosystems really go hand in hand. Biodiversity makes up ecosystems, and you, ecosystems really harbor biodiversity. So we can't really have one without the other. And that's why when we talk about preserving biodiversity, we're also talking about preserving ecosystems. And the importance of biodiversity in ecosystems is essentially that diversity part. It's really important that we focus on that because we need these different species to be working together. You need the plants to get eaten by herbivores and then the carnivores to eat the herbivores to keep that food chain, to keep natural cycles going. And so when we think of biodiversity, I always focus on the diversity part and every aspect and genes and species and different ecosystems. Um, so it really does encompass everything and it can also be broken down into parts and that's the beauty of it. And so when we think of ecosystem, we may think of like this, a forest, um, the Amazon rainforest in this case, but of course ecosystems are everywhere. They can be in your backyard, they can be um, in the city as well. And so we do see that nature is just everywhere and that means that biodiversity is everywhere too. And ecosystems are what provide us everything that we need to survive. And they really contain all of that, the food, water, soil, um, according to Conservation International, and I would add shelter as well. And so when we think of preserving biodiversity, I also like to emphasize that we're preserving ourselves in this case too, because we are part of these ecosystems. We can't really have one without the other. We can't have humans without ecosystems and we can't have ecosystems without humans. So the same way that biodiversity goes in line with ecosystems, so do we. And so, oh, before I go to the next one actually. So when we think of all of this and how it's so important to us to really preserve all of it, then we think of, okay, how do we actually preserve all of it then? Because now that we know it's so important, what can we do to make sure that we actually contain all of that and, and maintain the abundance that a lot of biodiversity provides? Because it also provides medicine. It also provides, again, everything that we need to survive. And so the first step we can do is essentially stop the bad, essentially stop pollution and stop whatever is making um, ecosystems degrade in this moment and whatever is making us lose biodiversity in many places. We're seeing species go ex extinct. We're seeing the loss of rivers. Um, if all of you have heard in the news in East Palestine, Ohio, we have a huge situation right now where the river fish are dying. The river is just, it's so polluted and we don't know how long it's going to take to, to come back. And so when we think of stop pollution, we think of stop events like that as much as possible. 
And pollution can come in all different types of forms. In that case, we had water pollution. And the one in Ohio, we also have air pollution, which we know too much about in LA, just considering all the smog that we have. We also have soil pollution, and that's when we get pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, or other things that go into our soil and into our food. And we also have noise pollution. Um, again, being in LA, we know that. We know light pollution as well because of the city and everything that it brings. We also have chemical, plastic, and radioactive pollution. And so it, it can feel really overwhelming to think, well, how do we just stop all of this together? And I just think it's little by little, and I think it's doing what we can wherever we are. So as being people in LA, we can try to just minimize the harms that we are causing to the ecosystems in LA and go from there. And then when, after stopping the bad, or in tandem with stopping the bad, I should say, we can also preserve what is left because again, a lot of ecosystems are already degraded. So why don't we make sure that whatever is left is contained and maintained for centuries? And so when we think of preserving whatever is left, it means like stopping deforestation, making sure that um, places like the Amazon rainforest that hold a lot of biodiversity, keeping that intact as much as possible, because we also don't know what'll happen if we lose more forests, it can lead to just more breakdown overall. And this doesn't mean that we have to um, like stop eating food or stop, you know, we can't harvest anymore because we need to stop deforestation. It's just working with the land. And so we can harvest our food and then make sure that we give the land enough time to regenerate before we harvest again. And so it's just going in line with natural cycles and natural seasons and, and yeah, and instead of, um, making it seem like we're apart from nature, making it seem like, oh, we can't touch nature. It's not necessarily about that. It's just about working with different lands and um, kind of moving with the land as well. So we see a lot of regenerative agricultural places. They have a plot of land where they harvest a certain crop and then they go to a different crop later on. And that, that place has time to regenerate. And so that's how we work with the land. And of course that it contains water, carbon, um, nutrient cycles, all of that is being considered when it, we do place, when we do practices like regenerative agriculture. With that, we also have wildlife conservation. And this is another thing that also seems to be like, oh, we need to create these parks where wildlife can go there and we can go here and we just stay apart. And then that way we don't harm them. But that doesn't really work that way because of course, animals roam everywhere. And if we keep doing that, if we keep um, trying to keep them in certain areas, the areas where they aren't, like in the middle of the city, actually do degrade because again, they are part of the ecosystems. All these moving parts really do make parts, of, uh, really do make the whole. And so whenever we take out one part, we're actually unraveling the thread that we don't know where it'll, it'll lead. So when we think of wildlife conservation, we can think of minimizing the threats that they're experiencing like habitat loss, like pollution and wildlife trafficking, legal or illegal. But we can also think about just coexistence, just working with them. Um, in a lot of places we have animals that are such as coyotes that are deemed as nuisances or as pests. And so there's a lot of lethal control, a lot of killings just to keep them in a certain population. And we see that that doesn't necessarily work either for us or for them. And so when we think of wildlife conservation, it's conserving ourselves as well. And instead of trying to get rid of conflict by getting rid of a species, it's trying to work through that conflict. So it's learning about coyote behavior in that case. And then we can know, oh, okay, we can't go in that area when it's this time, but I can go earlier or later. Or if I do go in that area, how do I take precautions so that we can live side by side in harmony? And of course, we can't have the lands without the animals or the, or we can't have the animals without the lands and the waterways. And so it's not only stopping the bad and preserving what is in what is still here. Now we're moving towards regenerative. We're moving towards restoring what has been lost. And that's really where the work is right now, because again, a lot has been lost and it may not come back as it was before, but we can restore it to a certain extent and it can become something completely different than it was before 
but as long as it's healthy, it's still restored. And that's the amazing part of ecosystem restoration. So I already mentioned regenerative agriculture, and there's a lot of different practices that go into that. But there are other ways that we can consider ecosystem restoration as well. I've been seeing more places called um, calling themselves nature-based cities. The big, biggest example I can think of is Singapore, where they are making sure that they have the forest in the middle of the city. They have trees all over the buildings. And so hummingbirds and or just other birds um, can go all the way up to the building to find plants. We don't really see that here in LA and why not? We should try all of these different things where we actually embed nature in every single aspect, even in the middle of the city. And so here's another example of ecosystem restoration. This one is in Mexico. And you can see kind of in the back, there's like a brown area. It just looks really degraded. Um, it's brown, it looks stripped away. So that's what it looked like after they started um, intensive agriculture. So not regenerative agriculture, but, uh, but the agriculture that we tend to see a lot in the US and very intensive. And it can produce a lot for a little while, but eventually it's just going to run out of soil and run out of all those nutrients, all those cycles, natural cycles that we need. And so ecosystem restoration is what we see here towards the front, all that green. They're actually working um, with the land in this case to make sure they can continue their agriculture, but in a different way. So instead of intensive agriculture, they're working with agroforestry in this sense. And so we're still feeding the people, we're still feeding the community there. But in this way, we don't do it um, in a way that the soil will be degraded in 10 years or so. This can last for as long as the soil is healthy and as long as we continue to work with the soil. And that's the beauty of ecosystem restoration. It really involves active participation from all of us. And so we become a part of this healing and it heals ourselves as well. Um, I don't know about you, but I would much rather be walking through this beautiful forest than all that stripped land. And so when we think of healing, it can be a spiritual, mental, and physical healing as well for us. And the last thing that I'd like to point out when we, thought, um, when we think of um, preserving biodiversity is empowering local communities. In that case that I just mentioned, we saw that the local community is being fed. And so in that case, they're being empowered as well. They feel, oh, we're a part of this project and we're receiving benefits from it. We see it in our food. We see it in the abundance that we have. And so of course, in turn, you feel empowered. You feel um, just inspired to do more. And that's why even though this is a global crisis, it's happening everywhere, we can really act local. And what is happening right now in the community garden, the project that you're doing, that is exactly what we need to just really get local and work with the people around us, our neighbors, and get to know one another in this process. I love the my favorite part of all of this work that I do, um, just advocating for nature, is meeting people like you, that we just come together and think of these ways to improve our lives, improve our earth. And that is how we can really um, start to make change. Of course, we can have help from outsiders, from foreigners. Um, we do a lot of conservation projects where, let's say, especially countries like the US and Europe and places in Europe, they have a lot of resources. They can go and contribute to um, projects in other, play in other areas. But of course, the leadership has to be local because they know their environment best. And one great example of this is, this is a TED Talk by Kelsey Leonard, who's from the Shinnecock Nation. And she talks a lot about how um, the rights of nature can actually change how we view the world, how we view ourselves as part of the world, rather than on top of it, rather than dominating it. And the example that she uses is water. When we think of water, do we think of it as alive or not? Because when we think of it as a thing, we can, we, we're more likely to pollute it. We're more likely to see that a river can be completely degraded and people just walk away from it as if it doesn't matter. But of course we know it does matter. And when we see it as water as alive, she um, mentions how instead of saying, what is water? We can ask who is water? And so the personhood of that can be so powerful in, in our laws in the way that we govern and in the way that we just view everything around us. And so when we, um, apply legal personhood, we do see that there is more of a 
an incentive to protect the areas around us. And that is the beauty of rights of nature. It goes in line with pre preserving biodiversity because when we see ourselves as part of everything, it's hard to justify all the damage that we've been doing. And then we completely change our practices. So I really wanna make sure that we, again, see our, our own role. Each person has a role in this movement to restore the planet, to restore ourselves. And so the question that I want everyone to think of um, after this program today, after all of these programs, that the incredible programs for every week is what can we do to contribute to these solutions? In my case, I really just like talking to people, networking, volunteering when I can, um, spreading awareness through my writing, through speaking <laughs> clearly, but it doesn't have to be that for you. It can be anything. It can be planting the garden. It can be um, working with the law. There's so many different ways that each person can get involved. And that is another thing that's beautiful about this movement is all these diverse perspectives, all these diverse backgrounds and knowledge. When we all come together and each contribute, we really do create that change that is needed. And then it's from the grassroots. It's from the bottom up, right? Because right now, we do see a hierarchy where a lot of our laws are top down. A lot of just certain people are making laws that apply to everyone. Whereas if we all work together and create our own laws, then it actually does benefit all of us because we have more, more voices heard. And that is um, how we can actually change the paradigm as we've mentioned. And this is a, a long-term movement. This is probably going to be for our lifetimes. And so when I say that we each have a role, the, that role really has to be based on what inspires you. For me, it's places like this. Um, just going outside on my hikes, I just get reminded that nature is just beautiful and it really inspires me to want to protect it because I just love being able to see the sky, the plants, um, just more landscapes like this, more views like this. And that's what keeps me going. And so whenever we think of our role, and our roles can change with time, of course, as we evolve, we have to keep asking ourselves, what is inspiring me? Because this has to be a joyful act as well. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, pollution and all of these things that we're discussing can be really overwhelming, but there's a lot of joy in this movement as well. And just connecting with one another and seeing different parts of nature that we connect with. Um, it's just a whole, a whole, process of regeneration, not just physically in the environment around us, but also internally in us as well. And I wanna leave off with this quote, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth from Chief Seattle. And so again, just seeing how it's all connected, how these, how biodiversity is made up of relationships, our relationship to plants, our relationships to other species, to other animals, to fungi, when we see how connected we are with everything and how we really rely on everything, and in turn, how everything relies on us, um, we start to see that we belong here. And um, I really wanna emphasize that because I do think a lot of people, when they hear a lot of these overwhelming issues, they think, oh, well, maybe it's just like humans are bad. And I don't think that's true. I think we can choose to do amazing things. I just think we need to find again what inspires us and start taking action. So thank you so much. Again, this has been amazing and I'm excited to see what else we get to talk about today. All right, thank you, Tanya. So let us open the um, floor to anyone that has a question before we uh, move on to our community garden project here in historic Filipino town, Echo Park, <clears throat> because I think there's a lot of things that people want to ask or discuss or talk about. So um, let's see, what do we do? Should I unpin uh, Tania so people can present? Uh, yeah, you could do that. Um, you oh, There's also, are there questions in the chat? No, not so Just much. Just comments. No. Okay. No, so you can, uh, you can unpin. Spotlight. All right. So, uh, and then go to view. Speaker? Yeah. Okay. All right. So does anyone have a question uh, they can unmute and talk or type in the um, chat? 
I do, uh, I can start. Um, so, um, Tania, uh, what led you to this path? That is a great question. I, um, I, I got inspired first because of wildlife. And so that's why I think the biodiversity topic is so special to me. Um, I just learned about how so many species are going extinct and they say we're going to the sixth mass extinction ever in Earth's history. And that really just hit home for me. I thought to myself, I have to take action. I can't just learn that and walk away. And so after learning about that, um, and then when the Black Lives Matter protests started in 2020, or I should say they restarted, I started realizing that we need to combine humans with um, animals. We, I wanted to combine those passions somehow. And so that's how I got into the environmental and climate justice space, because I think that's a way to uplift our communities, but also other species. All right. Um, so one of the main question, <clears throat> questions uh, that comes up with um, biodiversity is always like a lot of it is economic. In the Philippines, I've been trying to restore the uh, wetlands there, and um, and the problem is that pe people in power. Oh, someone has a question, Anu. But okay, my question before I go to Anu is: uh, people think that nature has no economic value, and thus it's it's more profitable to wipe down. Uh, the forest and build an airport or a casino because it generates jobs. Um, so what can you say about that whole argument with economics versus nature? Yes, amazing question. I do think that's important. I've been learning a lot about what's called ecological economics. And so it's based on, instead of, um, like you said, commodifying nature and the parts of nature, right? So a tree um, and kind of go down to the, to the little parts. Um, ecological economics is based on like agroforestry practices like that, where you're actually working with the land and they're still, um, they're still making money off of it. And in a lot of ways you can do actually more, I think that's sustainable, more long-term economics, because right now the, the idea that nature can be commodified and that we can, um, just use it and make profit off of it. It doesn't really last long. That's the issue. I mean, if you, you know, blow up a whole area to mine something and then leave it, well then, yeah, you made profit for maybe 10 years, but in the long run, that's not going to be a lot. And so of course that profit can be a lot. And that's why people um, are continuing these practices, but it really just, when we look into the future, that is eventually we're going to run out of space and Nature is everything. I mean, we just need it to survive. And so if we um, if we don't look towards that, towards the future and what's actually sustainable econo economically for everyone, then yeah, we just, we won't have it anymore. And that'll be the end of economics altogether. And I guess it's a, a matter of who's asking the question, mm -hmm. whose value are we con uh, considering? Are we considering the value that nature provides to the the mass majority of people or the value that it provides to a handful of individuals. Um, so, all right, we got uh, Anu, uh, go ahead. Hi, um, everybody. It's nice to meet you, Tanya. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so I'm Anu. I am also a trained climate reality leader. Um, I'm based in um, California, it's in Palo Alto. Um, and I work with kids on gamifying climate change education. Um, and so I work with schools specifically and library systems actually as well. Um, and we just finished a workshop at a library. But my, my question to you is, you know, a lot of it is, is, is about sort of getting people to recognize how integral you know, the ecosystem is to us and how we're part of it, right? And, you know, be it the economic case for it or what have you, right? Like, it's such an important part. Where, when is it, I mean, I believe it's never too early to talk to kids about these things, but at what point, you know, where do you, have you had experience sort of working with kids and sort of how does it, how can we bring this message to them at a very young age? Because this is more of a mindset issue and less sort of, 
it's not a technology issue. It's none of that, right? So mm-hmm. how can you, any, any thoughts, experiences on that? Yeah, thank you. Wow, these are great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have been seeing some people actually start creating like books and um, I don't know if it's a show. I'll have to double check and see if I can get back to you on that. But there's this person called Susie Hicks and on Instagram online, she's called Susie Hicks, the climate chick. And she started a puppet show and it's, um, I don't know if it's like on TV or YouTube, but it's really cool how she's bringing this exactly what you're talking about, these topics in a way that's accessible and and fun for kids. And of course, it's um, it's hard to know that balance of like, how do you scare them enough maybe that they want to take action, but not enough where they, because as, I think anyone who learns about this, I learned about all of this when I was like 22, um, like 20. And so I was overwhelmed. I could only imagine, you know, someone who's a lot younger than that getting overwhelmed. Um, but I think the importance is also giving, letting them know that they have agency. And so it's education with, okay, but you can plant a garden in your, um, in your school, you can start composting at school, like letting them know that they can take action. I think at any age is a great way to just not only deepen that knowledge, but, um, actually start getting the work done as well. And so it works for everyone in that case. Um, I personally don't think it's like there's an age limit. I think any age can learn about this. It just has to be done so in a way that you make sure that their emotions are are validated and that they are given agency, I think. That's great. Thank you, Tanya. Appreciate it. Of course. All right. Let's go to Joe. Hi. Uh, just a couple of comments. One, uh, I would urge everyone to join a 30 by 30 project. The Sierra Club has one, uh, but there are others also. The idea is to reserve 30% of the land area on the planet for non-human beings so that they have space to to, uh, survive. there's also a further movement that's actually all started with E.O. Wilson, Harvard biology professor, who argued for 50 by 50, which I think is also a very noble uh, direction and, and, and highly recommended. Um, so it's one way of encouraging or supporting biodiversity is to make space for the non-human beings on the planet, if you will, and to let them be. And, and so forth. Second comment, um, with respect to economics, I would recommend a book called Donut Economics, which says, let's move away from GDP and more towards, uh, well, I, I like Bhutan's way of putting it, uh, measuring gross, gross national happiness. And the idea is let's balance uh, human needs, if you will, with the ecological needs of the planet and and measure economies and economics in in the balancing place between those two. That's the donut. In the one case, humans are not, needs are not being met. In the other case, the uh, non-human beings and, and, and earth systems are not being honored. So let's find the balance places uh, in, in work and live and measure in those places. And if we get out of balance, bring ourselves back into balance. And third comment, I know you're gonna be talking about uh, um, community gardens. I noticed that Jay Kupstein is on the call. Jay has been instrumental in bringing community gardens to Carlsbad. Uh, we, we both live in North County and Jay is a friend. and. Uh, you know, I'm sure he has much he could share that would would be of interest and value in the discussion of uh, of community gardens. Thanks. Well, we hope to hear from Jay uh, and and learn because we are basically just you know learning as we go, um, and so you know any input or guidance from anyone that's been doing it, uh, we we definitely welcome that, and. Um, we have some questions here, but uh, Joe, thank you so much for your comments. Um, uh, I, I read one of E.O. Wilson's books, and he's definitely, I think he passed away. Um, 
right? And yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, but his legacy lives on um, through through us, um, and so. Um, <clears throat> In the uh, in the Harvard Harvard class of seventy three, has a website and a series of projects. There's a whole team of people who are his students who carry on his legacy, and uh, and 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 vision. And uh, uh, look up the Harvard class of seventy three and their website. They've got some wonderful recordings of presentations they've done, and the the, the his students who are now ending the end, coming toward the end of their careers, uh, have much to say. Uh, definitely something I need to look at because uh, E.O. Wilson talked about the ants, you know, his research on ants and, you know, as something that people find insignificant or some people probably find insignificant. Uh, and and he, he delves into so much on the ants. Uh, and I still probably have a lot to learn on, about that, but that is one of the features of our garden. Uh, hopefully, feature a lot of, you know, uh, our uh, neighbors, uh, tiny neighbors in Los Angeles. Okay, and then the other comment here. Um, uh, from Noribel. Norbell, if you can talk, because um, you have a long comment here. Uh, let me just read this. Um, a region in LA has more than 30 biodiversity hotspots, but how can we better understand and identify our specific areas so we can connect with the groups and organizations closest to where we reside in the LA region? Um, I don't know if uh, someone can comment on that, but the other question is, how can we, or from Jay, how can we incorporate your biodiversity efforts with the 17 sustainable development goals with ecosystem services in our K-12 curriculum? Well, that's a very good question, you know. Um, any educator here <laughs> connected with the LAUSD? Um, yeah. Um, the, the work that I've done in the Philippines, uh, scientists, um, she's a, I guess, um, prominent leader in saving the, the mangrove ecosystems there. She developed a whole curriculum and approach, you know, the powers that be to try to introduce those to um, the system. And um, unfortunately, that did not go too well. So, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, we need more educators in the system to take on. Uh, Jocelyn, you have something to say? Turn on the mic. Hello. Yeah, I was interested. This is Jocelyn Biak of Rosenfeld. And so I was very interested in the comment of Nori Bell about um, the seven regions here in LA. Uh, that are hotspots for biodiversity. I would certainly want to know more about that. Maybe we could put that on our agenda, something we would pursue and get more information on. Yes, definitely. Um, something that our stewards could probably take on. Uh, I don't know if Norville is related to you. Hi, James. But yeah, this is this is Bell, um, Nori Bell. You oh, can yes, call me there Bell. There you go. Let's spotlight you. There you go. Go ahead. Uh, you don't, you don't have to. Question and comment. Yeah, you don't have to. But yeah, this is the reality. And Tanya, thank you so much again. But that's the reality with, you know, things that are going on. We have these opportunities to have these kind of sessions. And we're really very thankful. But uh, there's really a gap. And I work with public health. And one of the things that we, we know is that not everybody gets to understand biodiversity, but how do we link it? How do how do we make it real? Um, we, you know, it, it's a topic that is discussed in classrooms, they're educated really at different levels, but gets forgotten in a day-to-day -day practice. And that's why um, you know, getting to know these hot spots. Do I live in a hot spot? I know that uh, when I was in the 90019 zip code, I was near those um 
uh, the wells, the, the gas pumps. So I know that was a hot spot. But now that I live here in Echo Park, I kind of know where my hot spot is. But how do I link myself as a resident of this area with a hot spot, with people and organizations who can do something? And that's why I'm very thankful that this kind of thing happened and our son is involved. So he kind of gave us the opportunity to be more involved in our community. Uh, and of course, with the leadership of uh, Jocelyn too. But it's something like this. The, do we need, um, how can we advocate in this little group or in this little area of one of the hot spots in LA so that we can do our parts, you know? So it's making it real. It's not just mm -hmm. forums like this or symposia like this, but rather put our, you know, uh, put our feet, our hands, you know, into the, into action and work with our community. Great stuff. Yes, uh, definitely makes it more um, comprehensible or, or something that ta tangible. Yes, um, you know, because we when we talk in theory, it's really hard to kind of like make it relate uh, to our day to day lives. But having uh, the hotspots as well as the Echo Park, uh, historic Filipino town community garden makes it really um, relevant something that we could touch feel smell uh and and later i think we have our list of plants uh from vicky which she'll share later hopefully uh which i'm excited you know uh plants different kinds of plants and and uh at some point they'll grow and we could benefit from it and um uh, and enjoy the beauty of it so <clears throat> let's see uh Vivian, i think you know, um just oh. a quick comment Okay. A great way to combine these ideas of how to get more education starting younger, um, how to change the curriculum. And also, as Nora Bell's mentioning, I agree, we talking about the solutions is great, spread awareness, but yeah, we need to actually um, do them as well. I think it's about um, anything that's hands-on. I mean, if any of you remember, you know, the, your projects growing up when you were a kid, I remember the most, like when I actually had to build something myself. And so starting them as young as possible, doing stuff like that. I know that um, there is a movement for Milwaukee forests to be, um, which is like a mini forest. And, but the way that they plant it, it's very dense. And so it creates a mini ecosystem and they're doing it all across the Netherlands where they call it tiny forest for schools, something like that, but it's based in schools. And so the kids get involved in planting, caring for the forest, watching it grow. And so um, when we think of how to connect with the areas around us and how to make that tangible, I think that's a great way. Any project like that where you're incentivized to get outside and, and to watch it grow with you, um, I think that's just a great way of combining that, the education and also the solutions part. All right. Um, let's go to Vivian and then Jay. James, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to add on to what uh, Tanya mentioned. So about that hands-on experience uh, with younger kids as well as people of all ages. Um, uh, I basically I work for Los Angeles Public Library, and I am the lead for our uh, neighborhood science program. So I just want to bring to your attention that for the last two years, we've actually been launching the system uh, the citywide Bio Blitz Challenge. Now, if you're not aware of what BioBlitz is, BioBlitz is basically a, um, a way in, in a very short period of time, we mobilize, try to encourage all people living in the city to go out and I, help us identify, look for species, spe specifically the native ones. So these data gets collected through a citizen science project called iNaturalist. It is a project that's being utilized by practically researchers, scientists and almost all climate, any of basically, uh, I want to say biodiversity research groups um, or any people like us who are really concerned about the biodiversity in our own communities. It's a completely open source data uh, database. And um, so once your data, you, if, if you identify anything around your local neighborhood, you upload it, you can share that with our city. And the city itself actually has a biodiversity research team in LA Sanitation and Environment which led by uh, Michelle Barton. And they have been using this data extensively 
they actually created one of the most comprehensive biodiversity report baseline report last year. So I would just want to bring this up to you if you're looking for another opportunity to learn about the biodiversity around your neighborhood, as well as contribute to LA Sands research on, on identifying the critical conservation spots in our city, where, for example, you find coyotes, you found light, you might have seen hopefully far enough mountain lions or any type of species. Um, these, the, any of these photos that you share on iNaturalist will be captured and the LA Sanitation Environment team, they will be able to use that data and then present that to, to their committee. So they will be able to, to have something as an evidence to the planning uh, city planning to say that we need to start conserve certain areas for wildlife preservation. So just wanna bring that up to you. Um, also the city um, for LA Public Library, we have the neighborhood science kits focusing on getting people go out in nature, exploring biodiversity within their um, neighborhood. So, and we only currently have about 31 locations that um, have these biodiversity exploration kits that you can check out. I put the link in the chat. So if you're interested, you can check that out as well. One last thing, um, we actually, started this thing um, two years ago, we call it Everything Earth between March 1st through May 15th. As you all know, March and April is like a big thing for Earth. You have Earth Day, you have Earth Hour, you have almost anything that's happening ties into an Earth campaign happens in those two months. So we just extend it into the month of May. And also because we're celebrating Citizen Science Month, um, we are, some of our branches are actually doing something very fun called um, Soil Your Socks campaign. What they do is they will be um, having a short, pro a small program in their branch talking about soil. And what you would do, what they would do is they will give you a one single uh, cotton, 100% cotton sock that you can bury into the soil or whether you want to do it in the library or you want to take it home, bury somewhere around your, um, your neighborhood, make sure you remember where it is. And in eight weeks of time, you're going to dig that out and then they're going to expect basically, you know, have you investigate and take a look at the sock. Now, if your soil is good, that means the sock, when you dig it out, it will be pretty much deteriorated. It will be like pretty much degraded. Now, if your soil is not good, you will see your sock will probably be pretty much in still intact. So that's another thing, since we're talking about community garden, maybe um, that would be something that James, you want to consider doing at Echo Park. Um. I still have two months th that I need to uh, uh, <laughs> figure out programming for. Uh, I'm looking for a so soil scientist or uh, <laughs> expert um, for the month of um, May or April. I don't know when, which month it is, but uh, it is definitely one of an important topic, uh, soil versus dirt, um, how it all relates. And that clearly shows how there is a difference between healthy soil and just, you know, a dead ecosystem. We talk about biodiversity, there it is, you know, your garden, uh, our community garden, um, the biodiversity below land. And um, Tanya, I'm not sure if you wanna share something about, you know, the biodiversity that lives um, under our feet. Yeah, that's so true. It's it's definitely one that gets forgotten a lot. Um, and I know I mentioned fungi, but I know I didn't get too much into it. So I'm glad that we're, we're bringing that up. Um, yeah, we see that it's really just all connected to the plants, right? And so fungi, um, we think of mushrooms, and but that's really just what's on top. There's a whole network under under our feet. And the mycelial network, what network, um, the mycelium is really what's keeping everything together. And that's part of that nutrient cycle. Um, and so in, we always say in nature, nothing is wasted. And that's just because things get decomposed. And so something eats that, and then eventually that gets eaten again. And so it's just that cycle and soil really keeps that cycle going. Um, healthy soil with mycelial networks really keeps that cycle going. And so definitely something that we need to consider more. And I, I love that more people are starting to research it. Like, um, uh, I actually have, yes, right here. Suzanne Samard, um, finding the mother tree. I can put that in the, in the chat, but here she talks about how, how trees are dependent on, on soil and the mycelial networks to get the sugars that they need from 
to actually create that and how they actually talk through the, those networks to each other. Um, and so healthy forest is actually based because of fungi, it's not just trees. And so that's just one example of how really, again, everything is connected. Yeah, and as soon as we get the plants ordered, uh, we can start digging and, and getting our plants dirty and start, you know, really exploring by biodiversity and a macro and micro level. So Jay, um, it's your turn to shine. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Yeah, great to see Joe Hood and uh, on this program with with us and uh, he does such remarkable work and does so much research, uh, a great person to, to connect with. Anyway, I've had the opportunity of, of starting the community gardens here, a collaborative here in Carlsbad, California. We have $3 million gardens and a fourth one coming in this month. And um, one of our gardens is the oldest community garden in San Diego County, about 35 years uh, that it's been in existence, well, 40 years right now. Anyway, some of the things that I've been working on that might be of interest, um, if you go to AARP, uh, it's called AARP Livable Communities. And there's a great opportunity there for community gardens and some wonderful PDFs that you can download of 30 to 40 pages that uh, will help all of us uh, on the biodiversity end and also to encourage communities to start to participate. Anyway, there's, there's like $2,500 grants and they give out uh, upwards of uh, 100 or more of those um, $3,000 grants or $2,500 grants. The other one is Whole Foods uh, up through March 1st. Uh, AARP is up through March 15th. So you can just go on to AARP's livable communities. So, um, one of the things that I'm working on with regard to that is um, I work with retired teachers across the state and, um, and they've given me $100,000 to reach out to uh, teachers in the classroom and emphasize uh, biodiversity, uh, gardens, uh, just connecting with nature and connecting with climate change and those kinds of things. Anyway, what I'm trying to do is reach out or roll out uh, to the PTAs, for example, in school districts through Zoom and through on-site efforts is uh, to roll out or roll in some tower gardens to make like a food forest. But the tower gardens individually can, you can plant 30 some plants in them, typically salads and things like that. But they're great examples to share STEM skill sets with. Uh, you know, the science, technology, and, uh, and various things with regard to mathematics, uh, STEM skill sets, I call them. And it's a great opportunity to share the, uh, the sustainable development goals worldwide, the 17 goals that connect very well with nutrition and biodiversity. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've been really successful with is not only putting in the community gardens, but also implementing seed libraries. So connecting seed libraries, I think with our school libraries and uh, campuses and with the PTAs, for example. Hard to get into a school district, but easy to get in with the PTAs because they have programs that they share with the campus. And they're, they're wonderful models to use this idea of community gardens or campus gardens. So, uh, I really encourage us to draw upon their statewide, local, district-wide, and uh, also national level programs. And I think this idea of AARP's community gardens uh, can be related to the campus gardens. Anyway, so I'm trying to roll out these tower gardens uh, and make uh, portable seed libraries as a part of a podcast or Zoom sessions that can go across to our 80 divisions across the state. We have 40 some thousand retired teachers as members in our association. And so they go out and give $70 million each year of volunteer time in the classroom. So I thought connecting them uh, with efforts to form teams that can go out into the classroom and, or excuse me, go out to the districts and meet with the PTAs that 
we might be able to really get to this point of, of um, salvaging our biodiversity. Like you're saying, we not only have biodiversity that we're losing on you know, the great mammals around the earth, but we're also losing great soil levels of biodiversity that needs to be uh, retained. Anyway, my, uh, my email address is um, in the chat and I encourage uh, connecting with me and I'd like to connect with any of you to, to see if we can reach out and do some of the programs that we've all been talking about. That would be amazing, Jay. Thank you so much for those resources. We have our homework to do. AARP and uh, uh, was that uh, Whole Foods? Um, one of them is, uh, yeah, the uh, Whole Foods found, uh, Foundation. And the other one is, um, there's several hundred million dollars behind what's called the, the Green Schoolyard Campaign. Uh, the state has put in uh, millions of dollars as well as under the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, under that program, uh, there was a meeting at the, actually a meeting at the White House on uh, gardens and that kind of thing and the green schoolyard. We've just got such a high heat, heat in, uh, in many of our Title I schools that just have blacktop. And the answer is not to put in AstroTurf. <laughs> the answer is to put in uh, real biodiversity areas that students can use and teachers can use as classroom resources so that we have shade and we actually have my, what you might call a food forest growing on campus. That's a- uh, You have one time for one comment from the video person. Do we still have echo? No? Okay, we're good. Um, talk about food forests and talk about economics and biodiversity, you know. Um, with a very small piece of land, our community garden well, is going to be very tiny. <laughs> is there a way to raise a hand if you're a video participant? Um, yeah, in the, just go well, to the chat. Oh, I couldn't figure out how to do it. All right. Um, it's, um, it's whatever we want to call it, but the, urban small garden, whatever you want to call it, uh, the value is is there because, um, you know, changing the way people think, it takes a lot and it takes something to catalyze a change. And, and for me, you know, uh, what I've learned is, like for example, food forest, if you can make money, if you can learn to work with nature, you can make a living, or for us, we could probably use it to I think we talked about it here. You know, we grow some sage and other things and we could use it to raise funds. So, you know, families can, once you know that soil and water and all the other elements that, that go into these biodiversity systems um, could actually become an economic um, activity as well. So it's just learning to see things from a different perspective. And so, you know, uh, we pump a lot of uh, artificial fertilizers when in fact nature can provide that fertilizer and can provide that, that pesticide that, you know, Monsanto um, doesn't have to kill the divert biodiversity and herbicides and all that stuff, you know? Uh, so why not learn to work with nature? It's free and it's much better than what we could probably come up with artificially. So. Um, yeah, why not, right? All right, so let's go to Jim and then Carl. So, Jim? Hi. Um, I have a perspective that I think is a little bit different, and that is, is that we, when we say decompose, like you put a carrot in the compost, that carrot, pot, that carrot is recomposed. And when you eat a carrot, do you want to think of that carrot as decomposing in you? Or do you want to think it as recomposing and becoming something else? And so if things are recomposing from the perspective of life on the planet, that's a way that, that we can understand that we're not important. 
we're not as important as we think we are, right? We are just a part of the bigger whole. And that's a, a way to change this perspective so that we can look at the planet and our life within it in an integrated and balanced way and start to understand. The fellow that talked about the Sierra Club wanting to set aside 30% of place, well, you know, the people who lived in Los Angeles and California and the rest of Turtle Island 500 years ago were integrated in it and working with it and were part of that entire thing. The idea of tending the wild, which is a wonderful book that everybody could read and, and it would help with this perspective, is that wildness is, is an artificial construct of the human taking apart. We're not part of anything different. If you look at a picture of your skin and a picture of healthy soil, they look very, very similar. It's, you know, we're all part of something and trying to split us apart of that is a way that we got to where we are and we need to embrace the potentials that we can all find and work together with. Definitely uh, something worth exploring, Jim, uh, that, that uh, what comes to my mind is really, you know, um, some of the differences between the Western science and Eastern philosophies and, and approaches to life, you know? Uh, so definitely something. Yeah, uh, along yeah with I've, the, I've got something uh, about the say, science. One more, one more little thing about the science is, is that the word entropy has an opposite. And that word is new gentropy. Mm. And if you plant a seed, if you plant a seed in the ground, it brings together and creates complexity. It creates things that are growing and, and becoming more complex and more dynamic. And that's what life is. And our science is all about death. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so, we have, um, we have, so boom, everything's going to get bigger and better when we embrace life. We need to change from a linear perspective to a more complex perspective. And, and that's that takes effort, you know, and, and all of us uh, coming in and having these demonstration community garden sites um, will will be part of that uh, transformation as we move towards the next phase of of, of humanity and and and, and yeah. then and then reaching out and hooking up with all these other different pieces parts so it grows into something that's bigger than any one whole yeah permaculture yeah. permaculture yeah. tends to to build a little garden permaculture tends to build a little garden where when you make regenerative connections, all these gardens start to work together and all the pieces, parts of everything hook up and it becomes an, an understanding and integrated whole. Anyway, Correct. that's my two cents. I'll get out of the way uh, now. <laughs> that's what we're really all about. You know, we have folks working on the, on the uh, national, international level and the local, regional level and the city level. And so once we can connect all these dots, uh, not to talk about all the innovations that are, you know, possible, then we can really make this transformation and, and um, not be so overwhelmed by by this uh, problem that we, we face collectively. All right, so now, uh, Carl, your turn. Yeah, um, you know, I love the community gardens um, and the best place on earth for intensive agriculture is actually India. They grow about 20 times as much per acre as we do. <laughs> Monsanto has nothing on Indians, but they could use more water. And that the point that we have to keep in our hearts is that planet Earth is supporting 8 billion people. And it's doing so with a combination of natural ecosystems and a industrial ecosystem. And we can separate the two. And if we make a better industrial ecosystem, we can shrink our footprint on the natural ecosystem almost entirely. But that requires that we use the cleanest and safest kinds of energy in order to decouple our, and, and that means stopping with ethanol and palm oil for cars and any other kind of biofuel that we burn. Um, and instead, 
simply doing what nature does. You know, the oldest life on Earth is the archaea that comes from geothermal events. It's coming from inside the Earth, and it's not getting its energy from the sun. It's getting our, its energy from nuclear decay inside the planet. So nuclear power is just as natural as solar power, and it is clean and safe. And it's distressing to me to see people accept the oil industry propaganda and say that, oh, nuclear is more expensive than oil, and it has a waste problem, which is projection, because there, no one has ever been hurt by waste from nuclear power. They have been weapons programs, and that is because of the craziness of war and war planning. But the radioactive waste from the use of coal and oil and fracking is actually hurting you. You have radioactive waste in your lungs from coal-fired power. And we're learning now new things about how dangerous that is. There is nothing in your body that's radioactive from a nuclear power plant. It's been amazingly clean so far. And so well, we hope, we, hope uh, we see more developments in that, Carl. Um, well, I think the main thing is we shouldn't be keeping our vision short. We need to have a nice life for 8 billion people. And the moment people get to middle class, they stop having 10 babies, by the way, and we can actually make the planet stable. But we need to end poverty and we need to make more room for nature. And that means making our agricultural economy more efficient so we can draw back our farmland. Yes. And we can't do that without cheaper energy. So uh, step, by, step by step, step by step, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so right. what we're about is really like what we can do now, here and now, um, with, with our capacity and capability. So uh, who knows what the future will bring, you know, um, but all of us uh, working together and, and making sure we, we come up with the best solution, I think is, is the goal. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> let's see if we have time. Um, uh, you guys can go through the chat. Uh, there's plenty of discussion here, but um, now let's let's really uh, start to dig into this this collective project we have here in LA, Echo Park, we start Filipino Town. So uh, Vicky and Jaime, as soon as he comes back. Uh, we will have you guys um, talk about uh, where we're at at this project and what wonderful plants. I'm not an expert in plants, uh, and so I would love to learn more. Uh, so, Vicky, why don't you start? Start. Um, well, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, wonderful. Is it on? It is on. Um, but. Just following that last little discussion, I would just have folks also look at the Washington Hanford weekly uh, nuclear waste issue that has been ongoing, uh, just as a little bit of pushback that nuclear is completely safe and clean. But um, I'll just shift a little bit onto our uh, garden project, which is a wildlife habitat garden. Um, this was the vision of this garden was to provide a model um, for the community and for participants uh, as far as what can be done um, in home gardens to promote wildlife. Uh, it was felt that the best um, plant selection would be to uh, choose native plants uh, to support the native animal population. Um, so as part of a wildlife habitat, Habitat garden, we wanted to have a garden that would uh, provide food and water, shelter, and places to raise their young. Um, we wanted to look at the conditions uh, that we have in this little plot of land. Um, I don't know if you can fit that first. Um, Do you have those? Slides? Which one? The oh, the one that you said? Yes. Uh, I will look for that. Since we can't go out physically and look at this space, um, I did put it up as an image here. It's a, a 15 by 10 foot section. Um, and even though historically um, this area was a watershed area uh, where there were streams, um, 
because of urbanization, it's become um, a very compacted uh, area, which has a lot of sand and gravel from construction. Um, we've had decades of petroleum use, which has left a lot of lead in the soil. Um, and just going out and taking a small sample of the um, of the soil, you can see the water is pooled on the top and it hasn't penetrated uh, very well. Historically, this is um, more of a coastal sage scrub uh, habitat, the meaning that there's percent? enough water uh, oh, in it. the environment to support soft leaf plants, um, such as sages. Uh, it tends to be more uh, clay-like uh, and leaning towards an alkaline, uh, so with uh, alkaline soil. Uh, it borders on what is also called chaparral, uh, which has drier, woodier plants uh, with deeper roots. Um, the coastal sage scrub habitat okay. has more. Why don't more you present that? I'll make you a co-host. Uh, roots. Yeah, make me co-host. Um, just, I was going to try, if we were going outside, to do just a very small, quick te soil test demonstration uh, to see if you were out in the field and you wanted to see what kind of soil it, it is. Um, I don't know, can I do that real quick? Uh, outside? No, it's right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. perfect. All right, I'll just do this. Brought it inside. I brought it inside. <laughs> can I share now? Demo right here. Yeah, Vicky. Vicky, oh. demo right here. Okay. So I'll try to do this without making too much of a mess. <laughs> so the idea is you dig down about um, four inches into the soil. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then you get a little handful of soil here. You want to take out any pebbles or twigs that will affect the little test. Anything bigger than a quarter of an inch. Let's see here. And there are a lot of pebbles. There were there was a wall that was built some time ago, so there's gravel in there. Uh, let's see here if I can get it down. And just off of the top, you can feel it's extremely gritty, which means there's a lot of sand in there. Let's see here. I'm going a lot. All right. Okay, that should be good. Let me go through there. Okay. So I'm just going to put a little bit of water just to dampen it. And we have so much rain, and the fact that this is not saturated tells me that the penetration is very, very poor. So you kind of want to work. I don't know, people can't see. Oh, they can, oh, okay. Oh, good, good. You kind of want to work it for a, a little minute here. And maybe I should have gotten more so I'm going to get a little bit more. Well, anyways, this is fine. So this is a little bit of a ball test. So if it rolls up into a ball, yeah then you know that it's not solid sand. Um, so it's got some body there. And theoretically, if you roll this into a, a little bit of a rope, if you can get six inches, get it to go six inches without breaking, then that would be clay soil. This one here, it's, it's pretty close, but it's clear it's breaking already. So this would be considered um, a, more of a sandy, what was what they call sandy loam soil, very heavily sand. So this isn't so much of a native soil. Um, so we would probably want to supplement it a little bit with um, compost, uh, something to allow more penetration. And we can get into that when we have a soil discussion there. So this is what we have um, on our, at our site is a very, very sandy, gravelly soil. I, I, could, I could share it now, the yeah. site. I don't know if you can share that bottom picture. Yeah, I need to go there. Beautiful. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. So that's a very easy, easy, yeah. quick. That's there. Okay. All right. There's the plot. Oh, great. So that's the little plot there. Um, it gets full sun uh, throughout the day. Um, there, the existing plant there, or plant, is a uh, sycamore tree, which fits within our coastal sage scrub um, habitat there. Some of the obstacles we have there are the water vaults, um, and we're still trying to get the information about where the, the um, pipes run, so they, it doesn't affect the planting. Um, most of the plants are shallow root, are, are in forage pots, one gallon, so it shouldn't uh, affect it too much. But there will be a five gallon plant in there, so we want to make sure we don't hit anything. Let um, me know when so, you want to change slide. Okay, then the next slide shows kind of a rough, and again, we're learning, we're, we're learning through this process what will work and what plants would give enough of a, a diverse environment um, for the wildlife. Um, and the focus on the wildlife were primarily the pollinators, um, bees, um, butterflies, uh, as well as birds, uh, some of the ground life, lizards. Um, we, I don't know if we have too many squirrels. I mean, we must have yeah. squirrels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, the first, the, the main plants there is the Ceanothus, um, and we chose concha, the variety of concha, uh, because it's one of the best in full sun, and it can tolerate better soil, different soils. Um, it is also called the California lilac. Uh, there's about 50 to 60 uh, species in this genus, uh, and it's a nitrogen-fixing plant, which is beneficial because it takes atmospheric nitrogen and converts it for the plant use and also um, puts it into nodules in the soil. And with all of these plants, um, it, with the exception of the strawberry tree or the Arbutus unato, um, they are native to this area uh, and they all have um, some um, cultural uses among the Gabrielino, Tonga, uh, and Chumash uh, groups. Um, and there's a little bit of information, uh, just for instance, the Cianothus can be, it is used as a soap, the flowers, uh, as well as a root, pretty much all the plant can be used um, it, as it foams up when you rub it with water. Uh, so it can be used as a soap for clothing or skin. Um, so that's that there. <laughs> um, a lot of the seeds are eaten by birds, the finches, um, as well as um, they're called bush kids, but I have never, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that bird. Uh, it's a spring blooming plant. You can go to maybe the next slide. I don't know if you want to stay here. I don't know. The uh, strawberry tree or the Arbutus unato, uh, it's a variety marina. Uh, it's a, it is not native, but it's related to a native plant, um, the madrone, the California madrone. Uh, it does support uh, the native habitat, hummingbirds, moths, uh, the fruits um, are, very beautiful. Their fruit is eaten by robins and uh, starlings. Uh, it also provides habitat for um, for birds as well. There's a um, that's so tiny to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's the bush sunflower, which uh, Ancelia californica blooms in February. It's very. It's one of the few colorful plants um, during the winter. Uh, it provides this larval food for many of the uh, native moths, uh, as well as the um, fatal metal mark butterfly. All, all parts of the plant also are used, um, are used for different purposes as well. Uh, poultices for pain, um, 
they they can the leaves can be chewed uh, for breath. They were um, breath. Um, and it, it is just a fresh movement. Yes, fresh movement. Um, the white sage, you want to go back maybe to this? I think somebody mentioned if you want to go back to the map. To the map. Uh, another plant we were going to have was the white sage or the salvia apiana. Um, this supports pollinators, provides shelter. Um, to to a lot of the ground uh, animals, um, this that plant also has very a lot of historically uh, spiritual cultural uses across the Southwest. Um, it's also used the, the young leaves can be used uh, chewed to quench thirst. Um, seeds can be made into bread. Uh, it has a number of, of cultural uses. Um, we planted it fairly thickly with um, some of the lower, the smaller plants, the uh, native narrow leaf milkweed, uh, which is dormant during the winter. Um, this is the plant that it provides the larval food for monarch, monarch butterflies. Um, but because it goes dormant, um, we had the idea of planting it more thickly with other plants, um, which is the red buckwheat, uh, not related to the buckwheat that we know, um, but it, the red buckwheat does um, support butterflies and bees. Uh, birds use to eat the seeds, um, and it's also a shelter plant. Uh, Western yarrow um, also is in that same category, supports um, butterflies and bees birds eat the seeds. Um, so that's that's the plan so far. Um, we are still working out some of the details of the um, the watering. Uh, the plan is just to just to offer to use watering um, in the initial period. Um, but as we move on, it will de decrease um, to once, maybe twice a month. Um, but that's it, what we have at this point. All right. Thank you so much, Vicki. Uh, I think our plan, our community garden, or whatever we want to call it, um, is, is our habitat wildlife. It's a wildlife habitat garden, but with a community effort. So in a way, it is a community garden demonstration, community garden. Um, so um, now, if anyone has a question for Vicky or Jaime, which they are uh, spearheading this um, building of our community garden, uh, wildlife habitat corridor. Um, so um, if there are, oh, okay, to the Jocelyn. I just want to comment because uh, term community garden, to me anyway, involves uh, a real participation of um, the community members. So there are plots that are developed in a, a larger space. The space we have is like a, a stamp, uh, I mean, yeah, post. It is a vision of a community garden. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's well, there's there's no space for the community, at least in my my own experience. So I guess calling it a wildlife habitat, uh, urban garden would to me be more reflective of this because I hear people referring to community garden from all the comments. So there may be a conception that yes, we are a classic community garden, but it's not. Well, that's uh, that's me pushing for more initiatives to the Jocelyn, um, you know. Understood. That is the vision, right? And so if we get uh, all these resources and, and get our, our leaders to really, you know, uh, get into this, this um, paradigm, then hopefully we can transform more of our city into 
real community gardens Absolutely. and not just a, a dirt patch um, on the corner. <laughs> but I think there's a way to involve community um, by even just a, an announcement that if anyone is interested in seeing it in process, because um, just from, from past experiences, families walk by, people walk by, and they're all you know, people are asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? And it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to talk to people about yes. why that, we're planning. That's why I, I, I'm calling it a community garden because it is a catalyst to build community, really. Uh, so all these dots, it's it's just a um, it's a strategy to connect the dots. Um, so, all right, uh, Richard and uh, Richard and Serby, uh, now is your turn. Um, I know you met with uh, Jocelyn, and so if you can, uh, you, I will put you here. So you, you guys can talk about what you guys planned and um, what you guys uh, hope to achieve. Okay, let's see, where is Serby Richard? Hi, James. Hi, Richard. Uh, where is Serby? Richard, you will now be on the spotlight. And Serby, I'm not sure if she's still here. She must. Uh, have dropped, but okay, Richard. Yes, uh, it's your turn to shine. <laughs> All right. So, um, so as uh, part of the environmental survey program, um, when I spoke to Tita Jocelyn, one of the um, uh, one of the ideas that I want I was trying to pitch to her was to try to get the uh, LA community, or uh, or more specifically the Echo Park and Filipino community, to get into the habit of of composting, which is one of the, one of the um, um, goals that the uh, LA uh, has put in the Green um, Green New Deal plan. And um, and before I go into that one, the reason um, I came up with this idea was for three reasons. One. As a Filipino uh, American myself, I grew up with Filipino parents, grandparents, and titas who have, um, you know, when we cook, we we produce a lot of food scraps, either from preparing or for or from, um, uh, from after parties, and um, you know, throwing all uh, all all the food away, and um, and it's more so um, yeah, but the idea of like uh, we have so much of these food scraps, and why are we not doing anything about them? Secondly. For the past couple of years or three years, um, as of um, the beginning of February, I I have worked with LA County Sanitation District as a gas um, as a, a gas systems um, and hazardous waste engineer technician in two of the landfills, and um, w one of the um, one of the one of the LA's um, biggest goal was to reduce methane. Um, in landfills, and I have first I have seen firsthand how a lot of these food scraps and organic matters have cost, uh, have generated a large amount of methane in our landfills, um, especially with Pine Hills landfill, which I've worked recently. They, um, uh, we have one section of the landfill um, that ha uh, that has been over the years since the 1960s been um, burying um, organic matters, and of all the areas in that landfill. That produced the, the largest amount of um, of methane in that landfill that we use, uh, and has been the majority um, majority um, been the um, main source of methane that we use to produce into electricity. And thirdly, when I was in Canada with my with my mom Norbel, who spoke earlier, we started we also noticed that a lot of our a lot of Canadians, uh, especially the auntie, one of our aunties who lived there, have been um, regularly um, and habitually. Um, saving most of their, uh, all their food scraps in co in compost bins um, uh, via kitchen uh, kitchen pails, and they've been using it not, um, to not only sustain their gardens in their backyards, but also um, uh, making sure that uh, making sure that the rest of, the rest of the uh, um, their neighbors are also doing the same thing. So, part of the um, the green deal that the LA has been trying to do is to reduce um, one. Well, first things first, um, 
as of right now, since 2011, we have, we 76 of our organic and recycling matters has been diverted away from landfills, but uh, now they want to raise that number percentage up to 90%. And secondly, they want to reduce the amount of food waste that we produce by 2025 by around 20%. And uh, my idea that I pitched to Tita Jocelyn was to how can um, how about we get the community uh, our community into the habit of um, um, composting the food scraps more specifically. Um, by the end of this um, six month period, I want I want to be able to reach out to the community and provide kitchen pails um, to uh, um, uh, to get them to the habit of saving their the food scraps. And then use that food scraps to either one, um, put them in the green bin, which um, I know um, California has created the Senate Bill 13, 1383, uh, which has been in effect since January of, um, of last year, uh, where organic food matter can now be disposed in uh, green bins, which the green bins have been used to um, have been taken to composting facilities and create compost for farmers, uh, even for um, um, organic biofuels, or even use it to we produce electricity for the city, or they can use the food scraps to either um, 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 dispose them in um, in LA, uh, LA community projects such as LA Compost Organization, who take those compost and do almost the same thing. Another, um, they can also use those uh, organic waste that they put in those waste bins to um, create compost themselves for their own uh, garden. And as of recently, um, I want to incorporate that idea and use those composts to um, provide um, compost materials for the Echo Park Garden Project. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, free compost. Mm -hmm. And uh, my idea of, uh, um, to do the, uh, on how I'll be able to do this one was my original pitch to Dita Jocelyn was, um, as you all know, Earth Day is coming in April, 20, um, April uh, the month of April, April 22nd, I, I believe, is Earth Day. And originally, I wanted to use it, um, the opportunity if we have an event in Echo Park uh, or the Echo Park um, Library um, to um, have like a little booth or something to not only distribute these kitchen pails to the community, but also teach them, educate them, why do we need um, kitchen pails and how composting and how do we use this properly? Um, and just uh, Jocelyn um, kind of did tell me that, yeah, it's pretty, it's a good idea, but it is coming up soon. Um, so my, uh, my secondary idea for the pitch was, uh, we can still use um, Earth Day to promote this idea, but maybe by the end of the six months, um, probably June, we could probably instead, and uh, I, I just went um, after talking to Jocelyn, um, we could probably go to maybe a street um, within um, within Filipina Town or Echo Park where we can go door to door each of the houses and provide the free, um, the kitchen pails that may uh, I can use my stipend to to pick up a collect or go to LA Sanitation who provides some um, those free kitchen pails and distribute them to each of the house households um, and not only give it to them but also give a pamphlet or information to educate them like kind of like similar to what I said about the um the Earth Day um event how can we um how why do we need a uh, kitchen pail how can we um use this kitchen pail properly and um what does composting um help with um with the uh, LACD um uh, community yes that's the uh, the the biggest challenge is really you know uh convincing people to change their behaviors which mm -hmm. is the hardest one so mm -hmm. first you need to um, relate the information. So, uh, as a filmmaker, really, you know, my focus is is storytelling, and because we don't want to, when you preach to people, you tell them this is what you should do because this is, you know, what good people do. Um, it's not as effective as as trying to tell a compelling story of why this is actually a good thing. Mm. And so, mm. um, that will be part of your project. Is is um, you know figure out how can we actually make people change their behaviors. Um, so perfect. Awesome. Good job, uh, Richard. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we got about 20 minutes left. And so now let's open it up to anyone who has any comment or um, um, question. 
So are they going to give out free kitchen tails? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, oh, so so rephrase your question, David, for everyone. Use the like mic. Who, when you say who, who are you referring to? Well, I was wondering, are they going to do this? Give out kitchen tails and educate people on Earth Day? Oh, are you talking about our stewards or talk about the city? Um, who are you referring I think to? I'd like to address that. I, this is Jocelyn. Um, on a city level, LA City now is distributing tails to residents. So any resident can actually call the Bureau of LA City. Now, Richard is with the County Sanitation Department, but for LA City, you can call uh, the Sanitation Department and, and they'll uh, gladly give you a kitchen pail and collect your kitchen scraps and pass, uh, deposit in the green bin. And that's for residents. Now for multi, uh, multi uh, unit buildings, uh, the problem is that you will have to ask your recycling uh, contractor to do that. Uh, it, it hasn't really been developed for apartment buildings, apartment dwellers, but for single family residences in the city of LA, there's that. I'm really excited about that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's part, part. Uh, you know, this what Richard is envisioning is uh, educating. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there going the to be some events? Well, he's Earth planning. Day? We're planning that. Not okay. not for uh -huh. Earth Day, but I mm -hmm. think that it's the, too soon. Uh, maybe by, by, by June. Mm -hmm. By June, we'll select a certain area in historic Filipino town and distribute the pails mm -hmm. that he has access to. Yes. Or with some sort of plan. Yes. Right. Yeah. And to add to that, Tisa Johnson is right. Um, LA Sanitation it ha is distributing um, um, pails uh, by request. And my goal is to um, start small first. Um, I used Earth Day as an example because because the timing would would have been perfect. But I understand the time constraint. I only have maybe a couple more weeks to to make it happen if I wanted to do Earth Day. Um, but instead, um, I, I'm using the time frame of the six the six month service project to hopefully um, um, my like realistic goal to have at least maybe 25 maybe even 50 um, pails distributed and use the opportunity to educate those who we give the pails to. And um, the uh, and the goal for future um, is to, if this is um, a good project to, uh, to continue, maybe next year is we can go a little bit more um, big scale and um, do it on next year's um, Earth Day, so. All right, perfect. So I would like to add that uh, maybe, you know, put some incentives for folks to try it, you know, um, to, to see. And also the other one is to see something where, why would they want to do it? So that's mm -hmm. always the biggest question, right? Yes. So, uh, why would I want to do it? Um, uh, like, People buy plant like how I would see it is is really it's about creating soil, mm -hmm. and people buy these tiny plants. You know we have tiny plants at our tiny apartment, mm -hmm. uh, and so you know um, uh, yeah maybe some some sort of uh, soil building system mm -hmm. to uh, put into tiny plants of some sort. But that's just my uh, ideas on on that. Is you know, uh, if I was the if I was the person you were trying to to convince, mm -hmm. how am I going to use this? You know, how am I really going to use this? Mm -hmm. uh, is this just something an inconvenient thing that I have to think about, or is mm -hmm. it very important for me, or something that I find uh, enjoyable and there's actual use? Mm -hmm. You know those questions uh, <clears throat> that we want to I, have an answer I think, for. I think this is all different aspects of eventually incorporating it into our, our culture. Mm -hmm. I think it uh, <clears throat> could be a 
And it, we have to look at this long term and how do we create this behavior change? Mm -hmm. so absolutely, there has to be some rationale for why people should do it. Uh, so these are all different steps, but I think the idea is there. The city, the infrastructure is there. I think now we just need to popularize it mm -hmm. and create it as common culture. Culture. Um, so even the green bin was something that was initiated maybe two decades ago. I don't know. <laughs> Everything just went into a black bin. And so now we have a green bin and the city and our environmentalist uh, policymakers see, see the value of that after the green bin, we had the blue bin. So it's just building that culture of, of our disposal, you know, what we throw away. And so it's multifaceted and it's long-term. Yeah, and uh, one thing that I've seen successful organizations do is to make it look cool, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Tesla was marketing uh, uh, EVs as something cool, even though it's expensive or was well, very expensive. But um, I think, you know, I've seen those composter, cool looking composter, instead of probably calling it as a bucket or something, you know, uh, a composter. Uh, I've seen it, you know, as I'm like researching for products and stuff, and actually in the market where they, there's like little holes and stuff. So I'm not an expert in it, I haven't tried it. <laughs> Uh, but packaging it, marketing it in a certain way <laughs> where people who actually want to, you know, be interested because it's, oh, that looks cool. Uh, I think this is where the entrepreneurial correct uh, <laughs> facet of being environmental can come into play. So it's affordable. It makes it easier. I mean, so, some of those things, it's cool. Maybe it doesn't take up so much counter space in the kitchen. It mm -hmm. could be hanging, but this is where the creative entrepreneurial spirit that could, you know, can generate funding mm -hmm. for the entity or the individual that's uh, thinking of that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and it all, it all benefits everybody. Exactly. Engineering meets um, storytelling and, and um, being able to, to sell uh, this idea and, and the product. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. So yeah, we we are on our second um, month, uh, and hopefully we um, we can start something by the end of this program. Uh, the last part is about taking action, and so I think it's perfect to plan something towards that um, mm -hmm. in June. So you know that anyone can be part of this uh, in this great biodiversity that. Tanya was talking about. Um, so, you know, um, it is possible. There's a lot of things that we can do now. And, and really, um, it's, I think, the political will that we really need. Um, <clears throat> we have lots of resources. And uh, hopefully, we can reach out to what Jay was mentioning uh, additional resources with our retired teachers and and the um, AARP supporting community gardens. So um, any other comment, Jaime? Just think, yeah. I think uh, the library, uh, I, I'm suggesting a, a time change. So we are meeting the last Saturday of each month for the next three more Saturday, four more Saturdays. And occasionally, sometimes this has happened twice now that, that the library has closed because of lack of staffing. And so I'm thinking that maybe mm -hmm. just to inform everybody, we may have to change our start time to 1.30 instead of 1. Just, but we'll, we will notify everybody enough time, at least for the next meeting. That way, uh, in case uh, there's a closure of the library, we have to think, it usually happens in the morning, whether they're not able to open in the morning because of uh, sh uh, a short shortage of staff. So that happens, and but we'll keep everybody informed about, you know, you know immediate changes. So just All take right. note. <laughs> Perfect. So um, uh, any other comment before we kind of recap? Um, 
Okay. Um, so just to recap, Tanya, I'm not sure if you're uh, you're still here. Why don't you, um, you know, get, uh, if you want to leave some final words to close out uh, our session. Oh, um, before we do okay. that, uh, <laughs> Serbi, Serbi also. Uh, yeah, she was here. She had to leave. Um, oh, okay. I understand. Uh, something came up. She sent I, me a message. I understand. Okay. So um, I'm sure she will join us next um, on our next session. So Tanya, are you still here, available? If not, um, oh, Vicky. Okay, go ahead, Vicky. Just as far as supporting um, biodiversity, as far as um, to the choices that we make, I just want to make a quick point about how um, our food choices that we make, um, how the American diet has been limited down to about, I, think, I believe it's 30 species of foods for protein, uh, food sources, when there are something like 400,000 species out there, or is it 30,000 species? But in any case, uh, the, we can make choices of looking at different foods to purchase to, or to consume as part of increasing the, that diversity uh, rather than relying on those monocultures, which will be more detrimental in the long run as far as uh, plant or, or plant um, crop health, um, general health, um, but looking at that diversity in our diet as also supporting, uh, strengthening nutrition uh, and the agricultural sector, right, with our dollars, essentially. Perfect. Thank you, Vicki. And I think that's a, a good close to our session today on biodiversity, connecting uh, how we grow our food to what we eat to um, everything in between in that uh, cycle. Um, the businesses involved, the communities, the policies, and the politicians, uh, community members, us as individuals, um, everyone, all the stakeholders here, you know, um, we can build healthy soils. We don't have to deplete our soil, and it's just a change of system. It may not be profitable for some people, but um, we have to think long term. We have to think about the big picture, you know, and taking it step by step, step by step, and we will get there. And with everyone's help, everyone uh, pitching in and the community helping us build the future, um, the present and future that we want to build. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, for part two, focus on diversity of our um, sustainability program. And so um, if you guys want to reach out to us, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can send us a message. You can visit the friendsechopark.org website and um, send us a message there or reach out to me directly. And um, we hope to see you again next month where we talk about climate and our guest speaker is a um, an international lawyer and she's going to talk about um, ecocide and uh, other things related to, to that and as well as progress on our community, uh, wildlife, wildlife habitat, corner. urban corner. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everyone, and um, have a pleasant day. We will see you again soon. Bye. And and the uh, and uh, 